Uh, so, the new covenant. Uh, we've already seen uh, God blesses us in Christ. Uh, we're heirs because Christ is the rightful heir, and in him, uh, by faith, uh, we receive the blessings the Father pours on him. So if you like, we're, we're jumping back into the story. We've done the kind of substructure. Okay, this is how it works. Christ is the last Adam. He is merited where we failed. But in terms of the story, uh, we focus largely on the, on the Old Testament um, and therefore the older covenants, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenant. Uh, the final administration of the covenant of grace, though, is the new covenant. And we first come across that phrase, the new covenant, in Jeremiah 31. In fact, that's the only place, I think, in the Old Testament we get the explicit phrase, the new covenant. And Jeremiah 31 is it's both a very important but also a much debated passage. So I'm just going to read uh, from Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Uh, this is part of the, the book of consolation, so the, kind of the hopeful bit of Jeremiah. You might know Jeremiah is a book, lots of judgment and, um, uh, and cursing, uh, both on the nations and on Israel. But, but in Jeremiah 31, we've, we've come to the comfort. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. <clears throat> Notice there already, it's with the house of Israel and Judah. So this isn't some totally new out of nowhere. Okay, this is a renewed covenant, and the the Hebrew scholars, of which I'm absolutely not one, uh, tell us that that word is that kind of renewing word rather than totally new out of nowhere. Anyway, a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them, I'll write it on their hearts, I will be their God and they shall be my people. There's that phrase again. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbour and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. At first glance, when you look at that passage, it seems that, that, that three things are true of this new covenant. Uh, first is the law is moving onto the heart from the tablets, verse 33. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts. Uh, it was the finger of God that inscribed the Ten Commandments on the tablets, and now that same finger is going to inscribe on God's people's hearts, the law. So it is internalized, it seems. It also seems that all will know their God. Verse 34, no longer will one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. And thirdly, it seems that the new covenant is going to be unbreakable. Uh, when God, uh, in verse 32, says the covenant will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I brought them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He describes that covenant as my covenant that they broke. They broke the Sinaitic covenant, the Mosaic covenant. The new covenant won't be like that. Uh, the law on the heart, all-knowing God, and not broken seem to be the defining factors of this new edition, this new era, this new covenant. Now, I'm going to come back to those a bit later because we need to be careful with them. But the first question to ask is, well, okay, w when's that going to happen? Uh, Jeremiah simply says, behold, the days are coming. And what we need to, uh, to, to take note of is that actually... Although that is the only place in the Old Testament where the phrase new covenant is used, Jeremiah is, and Jeremiah 31 in particular, is just part of a whole series of prophecies that use language like the days are coming or on that day or in the day of the Lord. So they may not use the explicit phrase new covenant, but the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they are just as much about the new covenant as Jeremiah 31. Or to put it the other way around, when we try and understand what is being promised in the new covenant, we mustn't just zoom in on Jeremiah 31 to the exclusion of all the, the rest of the Old Testament. We need to look about it, in, look at the, the prophecy of the new covenant in the context of all the prophecies about that day or those days, uh, the day of the Lord. And when we do so, in the prophets in particular, uh, we begin to know something, well, something perhaps less straightforward. Isaiah 11, I think, is a really good test case uh, on this. If you're asking uh, when I, the prophecies of Isaiah 11 
are fulfilled. How would you answer? Let me read them to you. Again, speak about those days. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or dispute or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. If I said, well, when is that fulfilled? When, when is that day? It's the coming of Christ, isn't it? You know, the, the stump of Jesse. Uh, the descendant of David has come. In fact, those words are applied to Christ directly in the New Testament. But without breaking step, Isaiah 11 goes on. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, the little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play of the hole of the cobra, the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Suddenly when you ask the question, when will that happen? We know the answer is, well, not yet. But Isaiah doesn't make a break. He moves from speaking about the coming of Christ, uh, his first coming, to what we understand as the second coming of Christ, without sort of stopping and saying, I don't know, there are two days I'm talking about here, or after that. Or, it is just one prophecy. Uh, we know that right now, if you've got any parenting skills whatsoever, you do not let your child play with adders and snakes. Uh, If you're a farmer, don't put your cows and your bears in the same field. Uh, Why? Because, well, because the blessings promised under the new covenant uh, come in two um, distinct stages or steps. Some blessings come now. Uh, Christ has come, died, risen. But some are not yet blessings. And that now and not yet schema, if you like, is already interwoven into the prophecies of the new covenant. So Isaiah 11 is is a bit of a test case. I think in some ways it's quite a clear one. The same one prophecy both speaks about the first coming of Christ and things that are clearly the second coming of Christ, and yet the, the passage is just sort of interwoven. So when we return to the question, when does the new covenant begin, what I want to suggest is that we have to, or when do the blessings of the new covenant arrive, We have to answer in the same way, now and not yet. Uh, Luke 22. Uh, Jesus took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, uh, uh, the cup after they'd eaten saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I've already referenced this earlier. Uh, The new covenant in my blood. Uh, The new covenant is comes with the shedding of Christ's blood. As we might expect, remember Jeremiah, I will remember their sins no more. How can God no longer remember our sins? Well, because Christ's blood uh, is shed. But we need to be careful here. It is not, is it? It's not the case that no one could be forgiven until Jesus came. Moses, Abraham, Samuel, Ruth, Noah, David, But we know they were forgiven. We know they went to heaven. Of course, it is Jesus' blood that made that possible. And no coming of Christ, well, no salvation for Abraham, Noah, Moses, Ruth, Rachel, and all the rest. But um, Jeremiah's prophecy, I will remember their sins no more, um, cannot mean that until that day, sins were counted against those who trusted in Christ. So to go back to um, one of the questions we had earlier, and actually the the chapter seven of the confession again. Um, This covenant was differently administered sorry, in the time of the law, so the Mosaic era, and in the time of the gospel. Uh, Then there's a section about under the law, it was administered through these various signs and and, um, people. All for signifying Christ to come. And these sacrifices, institutions, they were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah by whom they had full remission of sins. 
So the Old Testament sacrifices and institutions like the temple, the priests, the covenants indeed, they were shadows pointing forwards, certainly, for signifying, to use the language of the confession. But I wonder if that's, that's where we stop. We stop a bit too soon. Yes, they're pointing forward, and hence they fall away when Christ, the fulfillment, comes. You know, we no longer sacrifice goats or go to a temple or need a priest, at least a, an earthly priest. But that's not all. <laughs> they were also the, the delivery vehicles, if you like, the delivery channels for the same grace that we receive. Jesus was still forgiving, feeding, blessing his people uh, through the old covenant. They were, for that time, sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit. So the Westminster Divines are happy to speak about the work of the Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, the building up of the faith of God's people, even before, for example, Pentecost, where the Spirit is, we read, poured out. So yes, the new covenant begins, the new covenant era begins with the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus and the pouring out of his spirit at Pentecost. But as I've tried to argue time and time again, the the covenant of grace does not begin with the pouring out of Jesus' blood, his death, his resurrection and his ascension. And all that he achieves in that covenantal era, the era of the new covenant, um, it, it can flow backwards, as it were. Uh, think about Paul's language again in Romans about God for a time passing over sins. Um, until the Messiah comes. You know, it, 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 it is clearly the case that Jesus' death is not simply for those who live after 33 AD or whatever it was. So that, that was all kind of caveating <laughs> um, and really goes back to, to what I was trying to say earlier that, that the blessings of salvation uh, are administered through the Old Testament covenants just as they are in the New. And yet the New is that the last and greatest uh, you see this, I, I think, even in the, in the, if you like, the formal, um, uh, the formal kind of launch of both covenantal eras. Compare Sinai and the New Covenant, so the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. I think Claire Ferguson's got a wonderful, wonderful bit on this in his book on the Holy Spirit, uh, where he points out that there are, there are all sorts of similarities. So Pentecost and Sinai, what do you see? Pentecost is, if you like, I think the formal day the New Covenant kicks in. Um, And clearly it's the the day when the Spirit is given. Remember, I'll pour pour my Spirit on my people. Pentecost is the day in in history where that happens. Uh, What do you see in both? Well, at Sinai, remember Moses went up into the clouds, up the mountain, into the clouds. Uh, God's people are gathered down below. There's there's fire and, and wind and noise and thunder. Uh, and down comes, or well, down comes the old covenant. What do we see at Pentecost, Acts 1, Acts 2? Uh, we see the leader of God's people, Christ, go up in the clouds. Uh, the people, the disciples, the beginning of the new Israel, remain below. What do we get in Acts 2? We get the rushing wind. We get the same sound effects as Sinai, the fire, the tongues of fire coming down on the head of God's people. And down this time comes not the old covenant, but the new. Down comes the spirit. Uh, there are deliberate parallels. And isn't it fascinating? Do you remember on the, on the day of Pentecost, how many people believe? How many men believe? 3,000 were told. Peter preaches the first new covenant sermon. 3,000 were told believe. Remember what happened when Moses went up into the, into the clouds, the old covenant? There's the disobedience, the rebellion. Uh, and death comes. How many people die? 3,000. Okay, that is not a coincidence, is it? Well, I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, the new covenant comes with greater power, glory, extent, and effic- efficacy. I'll we'll return to that in just a sec. So the new covenant is in place now. Okay, it began, I think, probably formally, officially at Pentecost, if you wanted to pin it on one day, but really the death, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost are, are, are one package. But it's still now and not yet. Not all the blessings promised in the prophets have arrived. In terms of the not yet, if you think of the the kind of people, place, promise schema, um, there is much to come at the second return of Christ, at the people of God, at the return of Christ, Revelation 21, the bride. At that stage, all will be born again, full of the Spirit, glorified, 
uh, the law written indelibly on our hearts. And as we thought about in the first session, we will no longer want to disobey. We will, well, our hearts will be so full of uh, the Spirit, uh, we'll, be, we'll be in uh, and no danger of sinning or dying again. Uh, the place, the new heavens and the new earth, uh, the, the, the wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the goat, uh, the new creation will be a place of, of wonder and glory again, but clearly it hasn't come. Uh, interestingly, again, the way that the, the city is described uh, as a perfect cube, you, you read sort of Revelation 21, 22, and you think, strange, like we're going to live in this big square box. And, well, I don't think so. Um, uh, rather, that the perfect cube is meant to remind us of the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies in the tabernacle was a perfect cube, the place where God dwelt, um, height, width, whatever the other dimension is, breadth, uh, all the same, whereas the holy place was kind of one dimension off, same height and width, but twice the length. So the idea was that God dwelt in the, kind of the perfect cube in the middle. That was the place of God's presence. And in the New Jerusalem, the whole world is his presence. That's why it's described as a cube. God is with his people. The dwelling of God is with man. His presence is there. And then, of course, is the final cutting off. Uh, there the final covenant curses fall on all who stand outside Christ. So there is a not yet element to the new covenant. Not all the blessings have arrived. But there is, of course, at the same time, and now we don't want to say all the blessings are future. Um, the people of God now are the church of God indwelt uh, by the Spirit. They are all nations, whereas the old covenant was largely Jewish and a few kind of coming in. Now, uh, the church stretches to the ends of the earth. There is no one place. Uh, the temple is no longer a building in Jerusalem, but uh, the church of the Lord Jesus, full of his spirit. Sometimes I say to the children on Sundays, um, when someone asks you where you go to church on Sunday, where did you go to church on Sunday? What's the answer? And they're kind of wise to it now, but um, uh, they'll say both leads. Okay, it's, a pretty, it's nothing like this, I'm afraid. We, we meet in a pretty crummy uh, community centre in Leeds. So that's one of the answers. But the other place where we gather is in heaven. Uh, Christ has raised us all to, to heaven. We're seated in the heavenly realms where we gather for his throne. You know, Hebrews tells us we've come not to, an, not to an earthly mountain, not to Mount Sinai, but we have come to Mount Jerusalem. We are there. So, so, so spiritually speaking, we are dwelling already in the, in the heavenly realms. We're sat with Christ Jesus on high. And so there's always this, this it's a horrible word, isn't it? But there's always this balance to be had where we, we try to not to bring blessings that Christ has reserved for his second coming back into our current era, but also not to underestimate or undersell the blessings he's already poured out in this era. Uh, the new covenant is more glorious than all that came before. Revelation has increased. We know far more than Abraham or Moses or Isaiah even did. And the confession is happy to speak as well about the efficacy, if you like, the, the power of the new covenant, particularly in the, in the administration of the sacraments. Uh, so Westminster Confession, seven, uh, chapter 7, paragraph 6, again, speaking of the covenant of grace, but now the new covenant, says this, under the gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper which though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them is held forth in more fullness, evidence and spiritual efficacy to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles. And it's called the New Testament. There are not therefore two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. They're trying to hold together this thing, this, this theme that I've, I've been trying to get out all morning, really, that there is one substance, like a stick of rock, okay, that the core, the writing goes all the way through. I will be your God, you'll be my people. Um, the condition, the faith, the blessings that come, it remains all the way through the same, even if the outward administration or dispensation changes. And in the new covenant, more fullness, more evidence, more spiritual efficacy. That's quite hard to define, isn't it? And, and I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty hard um, to describe exactly what the experience of being a believer is like was like for Abraham or Hannah compared to us now. I, I think that's difficult. Um, I, you don't want to overplay the difference. You read the Psalms. These are the, the, you know, the Psalms of David. He is clearly someone who is spiritually, frankly, far more alive than I am. You know, I wish I had half his faith. And yet there is a greater glory in the new. <clears throat> 
uh, and a glory that will be uh, insurpassably greater again when Christ returns. So what about life in the new covenant? Uh, what does all this mean for various aspects uh, of our discipleship? Uh, a number of things as we round off the morning. Uh, first of all, one covenant means one people. The Old Testament is your book. Uh, it is not Israel and the church, two separate peoples, but one people. Uh, you see this in all sorts of ways. Uh, one I don't think I've mentioned today, so uh, let me go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews, this book, all about the greater glory of the new covenant, uh, compares Jesus and Moses. Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Moses is faithful in the house, Christ the son over the house. But our, the point for now is there's only one house. It's not that Moses had a house, Israel, Old Testament, earthly physical. Jesus has a house, spiritual, gospel. No, one house. Moses is a servant in Jesus' house. Jesus is the mediator ultimately of both covenants, or both ministrations of the one covenant of grace, rather. And that house is the church. <laughs> Abraham is your father. You're part of the same people of God. I may know there are, there are some theologies um, that, that really separate out um, Israel and the church. Um, dispensationalism um, would be a big kind of overall term for this. And dispensationalism it has so many different brands and varieties that I, I've got, I can't possibly keep up with them. Um, but fundamentally, there are two tracks through Scripture for the dispensationalist understanding of Scripture. There is the Israel track and the, the church track. But that is not, I think, doing justice to the idea of the unity of the people of God. One covenant, one people. You get the same in Romans 11, where there's the plant, you know, the, the olive tree growing, and the, and the Gentiles are, if I guess most of us this morning are Gentiles, we're grafted into the tree. But we're not a new tree. One tree, one plant. And that may well lead you to have draw conclusions about the church. If God is building one people, right from the days of, of the fall onwards, we might expect a visible unity to the people of God. So yes, this new covenant is an international people, but the oneness still holds. And perhaps we might expect, therefore, our ecclesiology to reflect that. Uh, it's not that all that the Old Testament um, says about the church, and in the book of Acts, as they, as, uh, they look back on, on the people of Israel, they, they use the church word to describe Israel, as the Old, uh, uh, the Old Testament patterns are not redundant because we come to the New Testament. In other words, how God structures his church under the Old Covenant, under Moses, is not irrelevant for how he structures it now. Sometimes when you read books about ecclesiology or listen to debates about ecclesiology, it's like the only passages we look at are in Acts and, and, and Timothy or something. But actually, God is, there's one covenant. God has been caring for his church uh, for thousands of years. Presbytery is not a New Testament invention. But an Old Testament. <laughs> so uh, the, word, uh, the word presbytery uh, comes up in 1 Timothy 4. It's translated in the ESV, the Council of Elders, but it's the Presbyterion. It's just a transliteration, a presbytery of a Greek word, the Council of Elders. But that Council of Elders has not popped up out of nowhere in 1 Timothy 4, where Paul says the Council of Elders laid their hands on you, Timothy. Uh, we've already met the Council of Elders, the Presbyterion. We met it in Luke 22 where the council of elders, which is the Sanhedrin, uh, condemned Jesus to death. Uh, Paul speaks about the presbytery, uh, giving him his letters, sending him off to Damascus, on, on the road where he eventually, uh, of course, came to faith, got converted. God has always cared for his people through elders, and there is a unity uh, to the people of God. It's not as if Reuben and Dan and Gad and Issachar and everything were totally separate, was it? They were one people of God. Yes, they were in different tribes. They had their elders, but there was a unity to the people. 
Uh, and therefore, as we come to the New Testament, we would expect that unity to hold. Uh, one covenant means one people. One covenant means one law. Uh, we touched on this a bit earlier. Uh, it is the covenantal structure of Scripture that helps you navigate the different laws that come up in Scripture. Uh, chapter 19 of, of the Confession says that God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, perpetual obedience. That's the covenant of works again. The, you know, God was calling Adam to perfect obedience, as we said in the first session. But the confession goes on, this law after his fall continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness and as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments. We are still meant to live the life that Adam was meant to live, no longer meritoriously for our salvation because we cannot do it. But but that, that law that was delivered as a covenant or in a covenantal form rather in Eden still binds us. The moral law, as it's often called. Uh, It doesn't change all the way through scripture. You wouldn't expect it to, would you? It's not that in each covenant era, God kind of scrubs the blackboard clean and thinks, right, what shall I make obedience look like this this time? As if if it's totally arbitrary. At heart, the moral law summarized in the Ten Commandments is a reflection of the character of God and a reflection of who we are as created beings, created in his image. Be holy as I am holy. And so there's a continuity, just as the covenant continues, so the law continues, albeit in different use. But the different eras of covenant history also help explain why, for a time, other laws, extra laws, are added in at particular times for particular places that do not necessarily transcend their covenantal era. So chapter 3 of, of chapter 19, sorry, paragraph 3 of chapter 19, besides this law commonly called moral, God was pleased to give the people of Israel as a church under age, a young church, ceremonial laws containing ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings and benefits, and partly holding forth diverse instructions of moral duties, all of which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. Because the, new, sorry, because the Mosaic Covenant is not the new covenant, it was just a step on the journey, the child growing up, then there are certain laws, ceremonial laws, pointing forward to the great day of the new covenant that have now fallen aside. They belong to an era that is not our era. The sacrifices, the temple, the priests, and so on. And the confession also adds that as a body politic, so as a nation, God gave sundry judicial laws which expired together with the state of of, uh, that people, not obliging under any now further than the general equity Uh, thereof may require. In other words, God also gave in that Mosaic era uh, some laws that were for Israel as a state. They were, of course, just. Where do you put your boundary stones? How do you build the roof of your house? This sort of thing. But don't bind us now that we are an international people. So the moral law continues, but those civil and ceremonial laws are are of a particular era. Uh, One covenant means one law. We could spend ages on the law, but I I better move on. Uh, One covenant also means uh, we mustn't conflate covenant and election. Okay, don't conflate covenant and election. Remember the Jeremiah passage. I'll write my law on their hearts, put my spirit within them, Ezekiel. Uh, The Baptistic position will say on the whole, all new covenant members have to be regenerate to be in the new covenant. In fact, to be in the new covenant is to be born again. Therefore, there is no category of breaking the covenant for Baptistic understandings, most Baptistic understandings. And that's the big contrast, I'll say, between the old and the new covenants. But the the Presbyterian, the Reformed answer, not just Presbyterian, Reformed more generally answer, would say, well, no, not yet. For now, it's possible to be in the covenant externally, but not inwardly, just as it was in the Old Testament. Remember Paul's word in Romans 9, not all Israel were Israel. Not all those descended from Abraham are children of, of, of Abraham. If you ask the question, um, was Judas part of the people of God? How do you answer it? Well, you've got to say yes and no, haven't you? 
And outwardly, yes, you know, he's a circumcised Jew, he's part of the people, but, but clearly he's not believing. So the answer is yes and no. He was in the covenant people, but he broke the covenant. All the way through, we've seen that you can break the covenant. And I think in the New Testament, you get exactly this kind of language, the language of covenant breaking. Uh, in 2 Peter, uh, chapter 2, we read this. False prophets also arose among the people, just as there'll be false teachers among you who will secretly bring, it, bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. That's a redeemed word. False teachers will deny the master who bought them, redeemed them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now, what do you do with that? If you're, presuming you're in the kind of, uh, the position of we're saved by grace alone, we're kept by grace alone, the, you believe in the perseverance of the saints, the preservation of the saints, how can you have people who are bought by Jesus, who is their master, and yet end up destroyed. I think that's a real problem for the Baptistic position. Whereas, if you have a category that says, look, now, for now, until Christ returns, sadly and tragically, it is possible that some people will be in the covenant, the visible church, the people of God. And therefore, you can use that sort of language of them, of being bought, but not actually believing. Well, then you've got a category that helps you explain those sort of passages. Similarly, in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, I suppose, is the classic. Uh, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who spurned the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? That that, that seems to be covenant-breaking language to me. I'm sure you can multiply passages in, in your own mind, but passages where it seems that those who are counted as part of the people of God yet don't end up uh, in glory. I think that forces you either to say it's possible to genuinely be born again and lose your salvation, which is just not an option as far as the gospel is concerned, or to accept that under our new covenant era for now, because there is a not yet to it, there is a sense in which some might come and be part of the covenant people of God and, and therefore receive these really high descriptions, sanctified, bought. But that doesn't mean that but that doesn't mean born again, regenerate, elect. Now this again just to touch on it very briefly as part of the problem with the, the federal vision. Uh, where they, they, they see these sort of passages and I think go to the to deal with them the wrong way as it were they, they will end up saying look um, it is possible to lose your union with Christ your genuine union with Christ uh, so once you're baptised you have a union with Christ a genuine union and because they don't like this distinction between the visible church and the invisible church outward and inward uh, some of them will teach that you can be genuinely full of the spirit and united to Christ and then lost Far better to stick, I think, with the traditional reformed understanding that to this day, in our own era of the new covenant, because the not yet has not yet arrived, then the the category of covenant breaker remains a valid one. And that leads us, uh, finally, I promise this is finally, that's the question of children. One covenant means children remain within the covenant community. They haven't been evicted when the new covenant era arrives. Uh, obviously for Baptists, um, you don't give the sign of the covenant, baptism, to those um, that aren't showing faith, that haven't been regenerate, uh, regenerated. Clearly, everyone agrees that in the old covenant, the sign, circumcision, was given on the eighth day, not as a result of the child's profession of faith at eight days old. Rather, a membership of the covenant, uh, certainly in the days of Abraham, and if Abraham's covenant is the same ultimately as ours in its essence, in its substance, then in our days too, membership of the covenant is for those who believe and their offspring. Uh, Abraham was given the covenant sign to give to his children, and that sign was a spiritual sign, a sign of a spiritual reality, justification by faith clearly all the way through the Old Testament, Mosaic, Abrahamic covenant, Davidic era, clearly children were part of the covenant community. 
Okay, Jewish parents did not say to their children, hey, when you're 16, you'll have to decide whether to observe the Sabbath or not, whether to come to the, the, the temple with us, you know, um, whether to eat pork or not. No, they were, gr- they were brought up being discipled, living under the rule of God, the law of God. As we come to the New Testament, nothing changes. Our children have always been in the covenant people and have the privilege of receiving the sign and growing up in the, uh, in the church to be treated as church members, not pagans. Uh, so when Peter says on the day of Pentecost, this promise is for you and your children, uh, I know that if you cut that verse out and just put it on a wall and said, well, what could it mean semantically? You give all sorts of meaning. Maybe it just means this promise is for you and if you want, you can preach it to your children too. That'd be good. But rather, when you understand it in this whole flow of covenant history where the children belong, well, the new covenant too is a covenant for parents and their children. That's why in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 14, children are called holy because of one of their parents uh, being believers. Again, that is a status thing, isn't it? It doesn't mean all children of believers are born again sort of instantly or something, but rather they have the status of growing up within the church. They are to be discipled, not treated uh, as Egyptians. And and that's why you baptise your children, but I don't want to speak loads about baptism today. I'm sure you'll cover that on another day. But I do think it's really important in our church that we understand that that our job with our children is to disciple them. God grows the church in two ways, certainly through evangelism and missions, but also through covenant nurture. God said to Abraham in, in chapter 18, or of Abraham rather, I've chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Abraham's job was to teach his children to keep the way of the Lord. Of course that means believing the gospel. It's not as if there's some different way to heaven for, for children of Christian families. We need to teach our children the gospel to believe. They need to profess their own faith in time. But as Proverbs says, you train up a child in the way he should go and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Uh, some, I can't do the math, over 150 years ago, maybe 200 years ago, Charles Hodge, American Presbyterian minister, said this. He was speaking, he was speaking of a revival of religion uh, and the Great Awakening. He said, it may be highly useful or even necessary, just as violent remedies are often the only means of saving life. It's a revival that might be ne- necessary, maybe. But such remedies are not the ordinary and proper means of sustaining and promoting health. No one can fail to remark that this is too ex- that this too exclusive dependence on revivals tends to produce a false or unscriptural form of religion. The ordinary means of grace become insipid or distasteful. Perhaps, however, the most deplorable result of the mistake we're now considering is the neglect which it necessarily introduces on the divinely appointed means of careful Christian nurture. And here's his conclusion. Family training of children and pastoral instruction of the young are almost entirely lost sight of. We've long felt and often expressed the conviction that this is one of the most serious evils in the present state of our churches. We're all waiting for a magic conversion experience or to send our kids to summer camps or whatever it might be, the University Christian Mission, and you've got to have your big Damascus Road moment. Bring them up in the nurture of the Lord, uh, says Hodge. Malachi, you know, why did, the God, why did God make the two one? Because he desired a godly offspring. <laughs> Our children are the lords. He wants us to raise them uh, as such. That's why they're in the church. That's why I think even when tragedy strikes uh, and, and um, children are lost in infancy, uh, the canons of Dord are happy to say uh, that since we must make judgment about God's will from his word, which testifies that the children of believers are holy, not by nature, but by virtue of the gracious covenant in which they, together with their parents, are concluded, or included, sorry, Godly parents ought not to doubt the election and salvation of their children whom God calls out of this life in infancy. There's great comfort there, I think, in the covenant, uh, even for those who suffer the tragedy of losing children in infancy. Children are as much part of the covenant people uh, as adults and are to be treated as such. One covenant, one church, uh, one people.